The Wealth of Some Nations, Section, The Mechanics of Global Value Transfer. We may briefly present here seven mechanisms of value transfer. We will describe each of these succinctly before proceeding in chapters 6 to 8 to provide further substantial proof of imperialist transfer of value. 1. Brain Drain Richer countries gain one-sidedly from highly educated professionals migrating from the global south, many trained through aid-funded bursary programs. The effects of this brain drain and human capital export from the global south are the curtailment of long-term development there. Beginning of long quote. The world periphery lost between 1960 and 80 human capital to the tune of $16 billion to the center. Critical, skilled, and the opposition elements lead the periphery, with the benefit of such a human capital import reaped by the center in the long run. End quote from Tosh. Leaving aside the question of the extent to which worker remittances tend to be spent on luxury consumption and on imports, claims that migration benefits both the source and the destination country are dubious. If such arguments were correct, we might expect Jordan, Mexico, Jamaica, and the former Yugoslavia, Greece, Portugal, and other highly dependent capitalist countries to have become economic miracles. Conversely, major imperialist countries such as Japan and the United States send their managers abroad, but never their workforce. Indeed, it is a sign of economic weakness globally for a country to be a net exporter of its labor. 2. Illicit Capital Flows Well-connected firms and persons are able to circumvent regulation and taxation through misinvoicing imports and exports and withholding money in tax havens. Corporations report false prices on their trade invoices so that they can transfer money out of the developing countries and into tax havens and secrecy jurisdictions, ensuring that developing countries lose 875 billion U.S. dollars through trade misinvoicing every year. 3. Northern Trade Barriers Northern business interests gain from restricting the import of goods from the global south while demanding, quote, free trade, for their own heavily subsidized output. As a senior policy advisor for Oxfam noted at the turn of the century, each year developing countries lose about 700 billion U.S. dollars as a result of trade barriers in rich countries. For every one U.S. dollar provided by the rich world in aid and debt relief, poor countries lose 14 U.S. dollars because of trade barriers. 4. Northern Dumping Particularly during times of crisis, the leading capitalist powers turned to protectionism, with protected home markets ensuring that monopolies can sell their goods at higher than foreign prices. With the resultant embellished income, they can increase their output and dump some of it abroad, reaping profits even where foreign prices received are lower than the average unit cost of production. While the North restricts imports from the Global South, it insists on its own ability to dump goods on Southern markets, regardless of the effects on local industry. Haiti is a paradigmatic example of the consequences of this. In 1986, Haiti was largely self-sufficient in rice, a staple food for its people. Forced by foreign donors and lenders, however, and after the country was flooded with subsidized rice from the United States. Ten years later, the country was importing 196,000 tons of foreign rice at the cost of 100 million U.S. dollars. National rice production became negligible, and Haiti's poor became dependent on the rise and fall of world grain prices. 5. Repayment of Debt Debt repayment constitutes a drain of value from global south to north. In 2000, low-income countries paid a net sum to their creditors of 101.6 billion U.S. dollars, or more than three times what they had received in aid grants that year. Whereas in 1999, they paid almost five times more than they received in aid grants. 
From 1992 to 2000, debt repayments as a share of poor country earnings from exports and services changed as follows. Repayment of loan principal rose from 14 to 19 percent. Repayment of interest on loans rose from 8 to 10 percent. And in 1999, total debt repayments, interest plus principal, consumed 28 percent of the earnings of lower income countries. Developing countries pay over 200 billion U.S. dollars in interest each year to foreign creditors, much of it on old loans that have already been paid off many times over. Since 1980, developing countries have paid out over 4.2 trillion U.S. dollars in interest payments to global North-based creditors. 6. Unfavorable Terms of Trade the purchasing power of Global South exports tends to decline relative to that of Global North imports. As Heinz notes, beginning of long quote, During periods of productivity-led growth, prices of manufactured goods will rise relative to prices of primary products, since primary commodities also tend to be price inelastic, i.e. the quantity of them demanded or supplied being unaffected when their price changes. The income terms of trade, that is, receipts from exports relative to imports, will also fall, leading to a widening income gap between industrialized and developing countries. End of long quote. From Heinz. For non-primary products, too, the commodity or net barter terms of trade of the Global South's manufactured goods relative to the machinery, transport equipment, and services exports of the Global North declined from 1975 to 95. Over the course of the 1980s, the developing countries suffered a cumulative loss in total export earnings in terms of 290 billion U.S. dollars, an average loss of 25 billion dollars. For the non-oil African countries, excluding South Africa, that figure represents almost minus 120% of GDP, a massive and persistent loss of purchasing power. 7. Trade-Related Intellectual Property Rights TRIPS. The vast majority of patents on intellectual property are held by northern institutions. Three-quarters of patent filings received by the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, in 1999 were from five countries, namely the U.S., Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and France. Fully 97% of all patents are held by nationals of Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, countries, with 90% of all patents in the world being held by global corporations. Around 70% of all patent royalty payments are made between subsidiaries of parent enterprises, proving that they are not, as apologists claim, designed to share knowledge or encourage innovation. As a result of TRIPS, developing countries had obligations to pay $60 billion U.S. dollars extra annually, according to World Bank-related estimates. Our approach highlights the transfer of labor time and accumulated capital from the poorest to the richest countries in the global economy, while accepting the theoretical and empirical validity of the seven distinct types of international exploitation described above. We argue that 1. Colonial tribute, 2. The direct provision of additional surplus value to foreign creditors, investors, and monopolies, and 3 trade involving the unequal exchange of commodities embodying different quantities of value, represent overarching mechanisms of imperialist value transfer. Each varies in importance according to the level and type of monopoly advantage exercised within the world system, and is typical of a specific constellation of forces and relations of production internationally. Hence, phases of imperialism reflect the historical development of capitalism and its military and political bulwarks worldwide. A historical taxonomy of international economies of exploitation would account for dynamic changes in the characteristic methods of transferring economic surplus from and to 
exploited, and imperialist countries, respectively. Following Brown, we may broadly distinguish four eras of international relations underpinning the transfer of value from the global south to the global north. 1. Colonialism This period played a crucial role in the primitive accumulation of capital and allowed for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Western Europe. It lasted roughly 300 years, from the 16th to the beginning of the 19th centuries. 2. Commercial Expansion This period cemented the periphery of the capitalist world system as a supplier of raw materials and an outlet for the purchase of the manufacturers of the global north. It lasted for much of the 19th century. 3. Capital Export This period involved the export of capital to the global south, where capital was scarce and wages low. It lasted from the end of the 19th century to the economic crisis of the 1930s. 4. Unequal Exchange This period, gaining special prominence from the 1980s onwards, has constituted the Global South as a supplier of both raw materials and industrial products at low prices, predicated upon huge differences in real wages between the North and the South. Footnote. Amin disputes Brown's periodization of North-South economic exploitation, arguing that the period of unequal exchange as the dominant form thereof must be dated from the time when double factorial terms of trade became especially significant, that is, from around the beginning of Brown's third phase. For Amin, unequal exchange in terms of double factorial terms of trade is defined as occurring when Labor of the same productivity is rewarded at a lower rate in the periphery. From the 1880s onwards, he argues, wage increases in the metropolitan areas have sustained enhanced autochthonic reproduction, at the same time that conditions for unequal exchange were established. Nonetheless, whereas Brown argues for the centrality of capital flows from the metropolis to the periphery in this third period, His view is that there were then insufficient outlets for investment in the center, does not necessarily contradict Amin's view that wage increases would establish the conditions for domestic outlets for investment, or that they had already done so in some measure even at that time. End of footnote. In the following chapters, we will consider the historical and contemporary features of both direct and indirect GTV, in the form of 1. Colonial Tribute, 2. Monopoly Rent, and 3. Unequal Exchange. End section.